Welcome to Coder2 Developer. My name is Rob Connery, and in this screencast series, we update Mike Gunderloy's classic book, Coder2 Developer. That's 2009, one of my very, very favorite books. Now, in this screencast episode, we are going to be talking about the project, the inception of the project, what to do when you, as the coder, all of a sudden find yourself in an expanded role. What are some of the things that you're going to need to think about? The first thing that you're going to have to deal with is, oh no, I just like to code. And that is a natural reaction, is one that I had as well. When I found all of a sudden that my boss looked at me one day and said, hey man, you know, I can't make this call, but you know what, I think you can. Could you please talk to the client for me today? I have to go do whatever. And I said, well, I don't, you know, I don't really know what to say. And, you know, my boss had a lot of faith in me. He just looked at me and said, you know what, you... You can put words together. You can speak to this guy. And I remember thinking on the phone call, I, I just want to be coding. I don't want to sit here and have to hold this guy's hand. Well, eventually that attitude changed, and that's okay. Because as things started to wear on, I started to see that I could have greater influence and as, as to the direction of what we were doing, and I liked that. Greater control over what I was coding if I got involved at a higher level in my project. And that started to turn me into a bit of a craftsman believe it or not. Once you have a little bit more control over your environment and what you're doing, well, all of a sudden you start doing things on your own terms, which is one of the reasons why a lot of people like to have an expanded role. They like to move beyond the code jock sort of mentality, and they like to start getting into things like project process. So there's lots of reasons to get away from just doing the code, because you are a very smart person. You're a very capable person, and believe it or not, it might seem like there's safety in just slinging out code, but there's a lot more you can do, and it's exciting. I mean, let's face it. You have to deal with things like navigating pitfalls and risks to make sure your application is delivered. Uh, you also get to shape the way it looks, and that can be a lot of fun. I mean, you know, you might have inspiration one day, and you might say, you know, I just read about this thing in this magazine article. I wonder if we could implement that, and bam, you find out not only can you implement it, it also solves three other issues. It makes things easier. Your client is happier, and you feel fulfilled. So there's a great uh, opportunity for you to expand your role and to feel really good about what you're doing outside of just being a coder. So let's talk about you once again. In the first part of this screencast, when I was talking about, oh, things you might think about, who you are, your predispositions and prejudices, I mentioned that one of the characteristics you would have to cultivate was that of the open mind. That still very much holds, especially if your role in your project expands. You're going to need to have an open mind to ideas that come in from other developers or change in requirements from your manager or maybe change everything from somebody higher up in the chain. Now, typically, it sucks when someone tells you, hey, we're going to change course and do this, and I'm sure you've had to deal with this before. Having an open mind, however, uh, you can switch things on to a positive and you can say, well, maybe this will give you an opportunity to try this other solution. Of course, a dedication to learning and, and patience still very much holds, but even more important than those two, or perhaps even uh, underlying both of those things, is discipline. You will need to have discipline when you're taking a larger role in the project. And the reason why is you will need to communicate effectively, and you will need to carry out tasks that you might not always want to do. The reason you don't want to really do them is probably because you're not terribly good at them. You're learning these things. One of the first concepts that you are going to have to get used to immediately whenever taking on a new project is the elevator pitch. This is the why condensed way down into a single sentence. Why are you doing this? What is the value? Uh, what's going to make people really like what we are building and creating? Uh, you should be able to master this elevator pitch, not that you need to be the one to create it. Uh, your boss, your client, whomever uh, might tell you, here's what we're doing, and if they start wandering and meandering through, we're going to be the greatest or the biggest, well, that could very well be, but those are results. That is not the value. Being the biggest and the greatest uh, versus what we're doing uh, is results versus value. That is the first thing you should always be able to distill in any conversation. So if you sit down with a client, and they say to you, you know what I want to do? I want to create 
uh, a site that has in-depth, high-quality productions from subject experts that entertain as well as inform, and maybe we can do a subscription-based service with that. Bam! That's a great elevator pitch. It communicates the idea. And the reason they call it an elevator pitch is that, you know, if you're riding in an elevator with someone who asks, hey, what are you guys doing? Or maybe it's a manager that you have a chance interaction with. You should be able to communicate that in one sentence and not waste their time. You know, if the project you're working on, uh, you ask somebody, hey, what are we doing? What's the elevator pitch here? And they say, well, you know what? We, we have this social uh, networking platform that's just going to be the biggest thing ever. It's going to, you know, it's going to take out Twitter. It's going to take out Facebook. And we're going to rock and you're going to own the Internet. You're going to hear that. You will hear that. And if you do hear that, all you have to do is, number one, use some discipline and look at the person and say, why is that? and then just keep asking why until you distill down the elevator pitch. Getting at the elevator pitch is critical and the reason why is that it's the seed of the idea. It is what everything is based on and when the team that comes on or the managers that drop in or you know your wife or husband at home ask you what you're doing you really should be able to respond in a single sentence and communicate the idea effectively. Take a good look at this guy. He is your client. And maybe he hired you off of Craigslist and you are an independent contractor working for him and you find yourself now having to run a project. You are the developer on that project. Or maybe this guy's a VP somewhere up the food chain at the company you work at. And you are handed your own first, let's call it a small project, and you have to make this person happy. Well, the first thing that you can do to help this guy is to communicate effectively with him. That's what turns these guys on. They like good, effective communication. They like results even better. But just know, as long as you know how to talk to this person, well, you're, you're in. And I'll tell you, there's a secret way to do this. Uh, you could have a whole bunch of neat ideas about, oh, I've read about this article where I can use this application to manage this project. I can do this and that. Just understand the way that this person thinks and speaks. 99% of the time, it is with this. Excel. No matter what you do, no matter how you plan, you really owe it to yourself to use some type of spreadsheet. Now I know you're going to think I've lost my mind because spreadsheets really can be quite messy. But just know this guy thinks about things in terms of spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are how they manage information. Tasks, to-do list, prices and costs, you can bet that when they hired you, they had a spreadsheet of requirements. The other thing these guys think in is Outlook. They're going to communicate with you using email. They probably have a calendar that looks just like this one. Perhaps it's filled up with stuff. I'm going to show you how you can stick your project timeline right into their calendar. If you can do these things, if you can think in Excel, and if you can think in Outlook and make them see and work in Outlook with you, you will be a hero. And, you know, ultimately you might be sitting there thinking, oh, geez, i got to do all that to make this guy happy. Yes, you do. It's part of having discipline, part of having an open mind, part of understanding that as much as you might dislike spreadsheets and as much as you might dislike working with calendars and task lists and all that other stuff, well, this is your job as a developer. Well, you've just inherited your own project. You are the lead developer on it. And one of the first things you're going to have to do is communicate with your client effectively as to what's going on. Now, I'm going to keep touching on all of these subjects throughout the episodes uh, in this screencast. So if you think I'm a little bit light on any one of these things I'm about to show you, well, just know I will be coming back to it repeatedly. So what I want to focus on now are three aspects of the project and getting it off the ground that you will have to address straight out of the gates. First thing is a task list. What are we doing? Thing two is scheduling. When are we going to do it? And finally, billing. And they might not bring that straight up uh, immediately, but you know maybe some of them will. When do you get paid? How often? How are you tracking your time? When will you be invoicing? So I'm going to talk about those three things right now. 
And I mentioned in the previous section uh, today that you would need to start thinking about things in terms of Excel. Now, I didn't mean that you would need to work in Excel, so I want to clear that up right now. There's a lot of applications, however, that understand and recognize that the business world tends to run on the back of Excel. So one of those sites is Basecamp. This is a project management application, or what they call a project collaboration. And what this allows you to do is throw down ideas, have a calendar, task list, milestones, all those good things, and they walk you through when, why, and how to use them. This is a great tool for effectively communicating with your client. Remember, that is thing one. You want to be able to communicate with them effectively. That is going to make you a rock star. And there's not many sites that are better at it than 37signals Basecamp. The unfortunate part about it is if you're not made of money, uh, not that $24 a month is a lot, but for some people who's just starting out, uh, it tends to tends to be a bit expensive. It's 24 bucks a month for the basic plan, and you can see the, the, the limitations here. It's up to you. Uh, this is one of the best. Uh, one that I like to use is Unfuddle, and you can start off using Unfuddle for free. Uh, you get a free account, and you get one project, and I think one client, um, and it's great. It's a great way to start, and one of the bonuses is they host your source. We'll be talking about source control in uh, one of the later episodes here, uh, but you get to have uh, your source control hosted here using Subversion or Git. We'll be talking about both of those in later episodes. Here I am at Google Docs, and if you don't have a Google account, go get yourself one. Gmail's amazing, and Google Documents rock in their online spreadsheets and Word Docs. You don't have to pay a thing for it. It's all free. One of the things you can do here is you can create a new spreadsheet. And inside here, you can just start putting down tasks with ordering and sorting. And you can share this with your client. There it is. I will call this O Project X Plan. There we go. We now have Project X Plan. And if I come in here, I can invite people to share it. And I can invite someone like James or whomever. You put your client in there, you give them a message, and then you give them permissions as to what they can do on here. And you can sit here and you can work this plan together as long as you have a reference. This is a spreadsheet. Your client will be stoked. They'll know how to use this straight away. Now one thing I did want to mention too is that both Basecamp and Unfuddle allow you to export things into Excel. So if we come over here to Trouble Tickets for instance, you can download what's called a CSV or commerce separated list and that will go straight into Excel and they can open it up and play with it there. So that's exciting. So you've got your task list down, you're using a spreadsheet using Google Documents which is awesome. Well now you need to have a calendar and uh, first you might be looking at this going, how, how does this solve my problem with my client using Outlook? And well, the answer is it doesn't, not necessarily. But what you can do, one thing that I've done a lot in the past is I've come in here, created, make sure I had a Google account, make sure I had a Google Calendar, and then I created a calendar specific for the project. So I come in here and I can call this Project X. Project X Calendar. There we go. Give it a description, location, do all that good stuff. You want to make sure it's not marked as public, but then down here you want to invite your client, in this case let's pretend it's James, uh, to share this with you. And so you can uh, set the permissions, see all event details, uh, set it as you want, maybe have them manage it and so on, um, and then done, create the calendar. And it takes a second, there we go, and here's our Project X calendar. Now that, oh that looks a little bit funky that color, let's change that because when it shows up on the calendar here we're going to want to make it look uh, explicit. There, nice and orange. So now to make an appointment, let's say we have a meeting tomorrow at 10, so let's just say meeting with James, there we go and I'll create the event. Now notice this color is reddish pink. This is put it in my default calendar, but if I click on this, I can edit the event details and make sure I put it in the right calendar. One of the cool things about Google Calendar is you can have multiple calendars in here. You can see I have my wife's, I have US holidays. There's a lot of public calendars that you can add. Now changing the timing of this is as simple as moving things around. Let's say we move it up here. There we go, 11 to 12 p.m. All right, now we have our project calendar and what we need to do is to share this with our client and there's a couple of different ways we can do it, but what we really want to do is make sure they can see it in Outlook. So what I'm going to do is come down here, click on the arrow next to my calendar, and click on Calendar Settings. And if I scroll down here, you can see that you can export this information in a number of different ways, and the thing that you want to see is iCal. 
Now I should also mention that uh, you can see here that Unfuddle has such a thing and same with Basecamp. You just want to make sure that whatever you use it has the iCalendar format. So once you have iCal, what you can do is click it here on Google Calendar and you can just copy and paste this and send this off to your client and say here's a link for an iCalendar. Click on this link and we'll share our calendars with you. So to show you how this works, I've got Outlook open over here. As you can see, I've got it opened up to my calendar. And so if I click on this link, there we go, I get this basic.ics file. If I double click this, I hope you saw that, bam, Project X calendar right in to Outlook. It imported it in. It saw the .ics file as related to Outlook, my, my primary mail program. And it said, oh, okay, this is an integration with an online calendar. It pulled everything in and synchronized uh, with, with Outlook. If you work in a large corporation and your manager or people above you handle the accounting and handle the invoice and billing, that's great. Or if you're working for an internal project and don't have to worry about that kind of thing, awesome. You can probably stop the video now. But uh, sometime in your life, you will probably uh, be independent. Maybe you'll take on side projects. Uh, maybe you will just be a full-blown independent contractor. It's up to you then, in that case, to do the time and billing yourself. And I will tell you, one of the things you don't want to do is accounting. You want to leave that to somebody else. Uh, leave it to somebody who knows what they're doing. In this case, Harvest is probably the simplest, easiest, and cheapest application you're going to find. This is what I use. And um, it allows you to uh, work up timesheets. Uh, you can do time-based billing where you bill by the hour. And then on a routine basis, Harvest will send out an invoice for you. Say you get uh, every two weeks you get paid uh, based on the invoices that you send. Well, Harvest will send those automatically for you based on the timesheets that you filled out. If you do project-based billing, uh, you certainly can do that as well. I uh, do that a lot, um, and you just create an invoice as you need. You can see some of the features they have here, uh, some uh, really awesome reporting. If you use QuickBooks, you can export all your time and billing and everything into QuickBooks. Uh, you can track budgets. You can invoice against expenses. You can even use an iPhone app. Uh, they also have a desktop widget that you can install in your machine, and you can enter your hours that way. Uh, one of the good news uh, things about Harvest is their pricing. Uh, they start you out, uh, uh, well, you can do a free thing if you want. Try Harvest for free. Uh, you can actually keep it for free for as long as you like. Uh, it doesn't really show that here on this page uh, to tell you, well, you know, you can do 30-day free trials, but they also just, you know, two projects, four clients, unlimited invoicing for you as an independent contractor is absolutely free. That's what I have, and that's all I really needed. Uh, but if you go up from there, you can see some different plans here. It is absolutely worth $12 a month if you are your own contractor. Uh, the neat thing, though, is if you keep on going with it um, and you maybe bring on some folks and you need to track their billing as well, maybe hire on some help, you can just grow and grow and grow this. You can have different users come in and you can start tracking things uh, if you become a business. We've reached the end of part two, where we focused on the start of the project, things you'll have to focus on as your role expands and now you find yourself in charge of stuff. Uh, the takeaway from all of this is, of course, to focus on communication and have the discipline to make sure that your ideas enter your clients' heads effectively and the reverse. Hope you've enjoyed this screencast. If you have any comments, please leave them below on this uh, on this page, or you can send me an email to follow. Thank you.